I grew up in the rural areas, in a poverty-stricken family. I recall the, the round heart, the mud walls, the grass roof, the home that we shared with our chicken and goats. My parents were farmers, the kind of farming that never brings enough food to the table. I recall we were always hungry, in need, and desperate. I realized from an early age that I could not depend on my parents for everything that I needed. So I started making ropes and graduated into some manual work just to get my school stationery. And my other needs. There was not much in terms of other needs. It was just a nylon dress, wash and wear, and one set of school uniform, which, is, which was also the Sunday best. Many girls could not take that kind of life, and they went into towns and cities and became house girls. And Christmas, they would come, nice hairs, nice shoes. Those were the role models we had then. And we'd be like, wow, when I grow up, I'll be like a, I would like to be a house girl, because they looked so pretty. So when I finished my SNED 8 and got admitted to Limuru Girls School, a high course school, the school fees was way out of question. So when my sister uh, invited me to come to Nairobi with her, I was never sure I would ever go to school, but I was sure of one thing, that that was the right time to leave the village. So I came with my sister to Nairobi, and our friends were curious. What are you up to? What do you want to do with your life? And I opened up and told them my story. They were touched. They contributed money. They contributed high terms. And that's why I found myself in Limuru Girls School. That school provided a whole world of opportunities. To begin with, there was food. <laughs> there was enough food, timely, and not just food. In Limuru Girls School, we had chicken, we had sausages, we had eggs, we had bread and margarine and tea for breakfast. And as though that is not enough, the cream of luxury, we had a swimming pool. <laughs> so when schools closed and I went home, I remember my mom was very happy to see me and she went like, put your back down, go to the neighbor and borrow some salt, this githeri boiling. We were still poor. <laughs> so when schools opened, uh, there was not even bus fare to go back to school, leave alone the school fees. And I remember I pleaded with my mother. I told her, look, just get me money, even if the bus fare alone. And she just did exactly that. She borrowed money from a neighbor, and I went back to school. That is when I discovered that very few people write with their borrow pens until they are finished. Perfectly good pencils land into the dustbin. I rescued all those borrow pens and pencils <laughs> and put them into good use and they were completely done. I also perfected the art of talking myself back to class every time I was sent home. And so by third term of Form 1, my family decided Limuru girls was just too expensive for them. And so they looked around in the village and found a local school that I could join. I recall the conversation. It went something like, look here, daughter, we can only scratch ourselves up to here. You have to take it. And they said, I remember the opportunities I had in Limuru Girls School. I remember the luxurious life I was living. I mean, in a school that takes everybody to university, I wasn't the, I wasn't the most foolish. Going to university was more or less assured. And they looked at this day school that they were asking me to go to. And they said, never. And they said, if what you are giving is not good enough, you're on your own. I recall I went back to remove girls' school feeling like a three-pack. I felt like a daughter, felt like a mother, felt like a father, all in one. <laughs> I thought to myself, I'm not going to go back to that village until my life had changed. I went back to school, and at the end of the term, when we were going back home, I found myself facing the direction I did not want to go, but I did not know where to make the turn. And so I'm walking 
in Nairobi. And I coincidentally met one of my sister's friends. And she asked me, where are you going? And I just told her the truth. <laughs> I'm going, I'm facing where I don't want to go because of these reasons. And she told me, by the way, a friend of mine does not have a housekeeper. Do you mind standing in? I was like, of course, I'm very happy to do that. I went to that home. I just did no more things. I cleaned, I cooked, took care of babies, and I tushioned. Apparently, they thought my job was good. And from that time on, I never lacked somewhere to spend any other holiday in high school. And I finished high school, admitted to University of Nairobi to do Bachelor of Arts. I chose economics. I continued with work study. But then by second year, I realized that I was having a challenge balancing work, would have three places to tuition in a week, and studying. And my gr I was not doing very well. My grades were terrible. It is then that I met David. I knew David as a, a student doing a heavier course than me, and also knew that he was a student hustler, just like me. But then his grades were good, and I was like, how do you do this? And so he introduced me to spaces in the university where we could study 24 hours if we so, if we so wished. So every evening after our hustles, we went to study till late in the evening. And so my grades did well, and they did very well in university. So by the time I was finishing university and I graduate, I was sure of one thing, that I no longer wanted, that I did not want to live in people's homes anymore, and I did not want to do any housework-related job. It was time to begin a new life, to start a new phase in my life, some kind of independence. And so I spoke to David about it naturally, and he said, by the way, I also have the same challenge. I need to leave my parents', my parents home. And so he was like, let's solve this problem together. I did. <laughs> so, I actually, I didn't know that I was being offered a, a marriage proposal. <laughs> so we walk down, downtown, we buy a mattress, remove the few utensils in our, in our um, dormitories, and we go to this place, um, outskirts of Nairobi, a little room. We used to call it our suit. It was iron sheet up and down. <laughs> so you put the mattress down, and they are alive after college. And then I realized that what David and I had in plenty was love. But then you cannot take love, boil in a pot, and serve for dinner. <laughs> when that reality was sinking, when I'm trying to digest that reality that really looked like rocket science, <laughs> I realized I was pregnant. I was a bit scared. I remember this one day when I just done my meal of, of my favorite meal at the time of ugali and tomato soup. We used to have this bucket that used to turn upside down. And so we sit on it, it becomes a stool. So I sat there to enjoy my meal and my eyes focused on my legs. The red soil is very unforgiving. If you walk on red soil without, without shoes, and if your legs don't get enough moisturizer, you crack your feet and you crack your legs until they are white. Yes, white like paper. <laughs> Those were my legs. And they reminded me of my mother when I was growing up. A bit of soup fell on my dress and I tried to wipe. Then I felt, I felt the baby looked around in the room. I saw the smoky kerosene stove at the corner. The kind of stove that you switch up, you sing, <laughs> you sing water. I saw the dishes on the floor around it. I saw the nails. I saw the nails on the wall. Those nails were my wardrobe. I saw the mattress on the floor, the dust outside. I went into a truce, sort of like, daydreaming, have a wake, sort of like you are not very conscious. Then I saw it. I saw the monster of poverty, complete with a head and a tail, <laughs> grinning at me, wicked, a wicked smile. It was grinning at me and it, it went like, how far did you think you could run? <laughs> we are still roommates. 
I was startled. I sort of like woke up. Poverty was still a threat and a big threat this time. I intensified my search for a scholarship, for work, for something that can at least help me fight the battle ahead of me. Let me tell you something. I'd never imagined, never at all in my wildest dreams, that one day I would deliberately get pregnant, deliberately bring forth a baby, and turn my back from that baby for whatever reasons. Never had I thought about that. But then that became an option when my baby was born one or two months and I was offered a scholarship to go and study economics at the University of Malawi Chancellor College. David and I had serious discussions. We had to make serious decisions. And finally, I decided I was going to study and David decided he was remaining with the baby. On 13th, on 13th of October 2000s, when I boarded that flight to Malawi, University of Malawi Chancellor College, that particular day, I broke away from poverty, want, and desperation. <laughs> that, baby, um, that baby is all grown today. He's in college, pursuing a career in information security. David is all right. He's a professional in his own right. <laughs>